I am not surprised to see the end of Trump's at least first four years ending chaotically, since that is how they began and that is how they went. And that is why he was elected in the first place, to be a disruptor. So why are people so shocked that he continues to disrupt? All right, this is The Rubin Report. I'm Dave Rubin, and we are doing a quick on-the-fly interview today because I mentioned on the show the other day, I don't know who to trust anymore. I don't know who's making sense. I don't know who's looking at the world with clear eyes. And I went through my mental Rolodex, and Megyn Kelly popped up. And Megan, you agreed to do the show just like that, and here we are. How you doing? I'm doing well. For you, Dave, anytime. Clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. All right, well, here are my notes for today's interview. Oh, <laughs> and you're just I like got, Amy Tony Barrett. I got nothing, although my guys did tell me. This is, this is gonna air on Sunday. We're taping this Friday afternoon, so people will have to bear with you know, if any little crazy vote got changed or anything else. But generally speaking, as we tape this, on Friday afternoon, how are you feeling about the state of this election, the media portion of it, the recount portion of it, Biden, Trump, the whole damn thing? I have a lot of thoughts, um, a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Let's do them. Let's do them, I'm, one at I'm, a time. I am not surprised to see the end of Trump's at least first four years ending chaotically, since that is how they began and that is how they went. And that is why he was elected in the first place, to be a disruptor. So why are people so shocked that he continues to disrupt uh, right up to the last, what appear to be the last final moments of, you know, his, his if not his presidency, his, you know, the time in his presidency before election. Um, I think Trump has lost. I do. I know people don't want to hear that, um, but I think he's lost. And I think a lot of people are struggling to accept it, right? It's like a, a grief process. The first, first step is denial. And I think Trump, and I'm not saying that he shouldn't get, we should do all the stuff. We should, we should check out what's happening in Pennsylvania. He should see those legal challenges through. We should make sure we have a Wisconsin, a Wisconsin recount and a Georgia recount. Uh, but my assessment from where I sit out here is there are not enough gettable votes, even if he can prove fraud or some untoward process with the mail-in votes to get him over the top anymore. It, that that phase has passed. Do, um, do you have do you have faith that the numbers that we're getting are real? Like, do you have faith that not only the people on the ground in whatever state you want to pick, whatever city you want to sit, uh, pick, are are being honest, and that is being translated to us honestly through the media? Do you have faith in that? Not utter faith, but enough faith. I mean, these are the same people who did the count four years ago, and he won. So, let's let's be real. They, they didn't just become fraudulent, uh, you know, vote counters in the past four years, and they also hated him four years ago. They're, it's not like they loved him. They thought he was going to be full of love and rainbows when he got into office. They wanted to kill him four years ago. And, you know, Philadelphia is famous for its voter fraud. And so, like, these, these problems have existed long before now. And what I'm seeing in the electoral process is, it to me, it's akin to, like, when we went HD in television, where... <laughs> Everything looked just fine when it was like this, a little fuzzy. And then like, when you could see it up close and personal, it was like, my eyes, I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I didn't want to see this, it's hideous. <laughs> and that's what's happening with our electoral process. It's, it isn't perfect, it's far from perfect. It's the best we have. Should we do better? Can we do better? Yes and yes. Hello, Florida, let's just be like Florida. Um, but we're not right now. And we're not going to get it to the point of, ah, now it's perfect. And we can perfectly know that every vote that was proper was counted and everyone that wasn't was not. It's not going to happen, people. That's not the way our system is built. So we're going to have to do good enough. That's how the system's set up. And the, even the, the votes he's counting, even the ones he's like, that was fraudulently filled out or that's blah, blah, blah. You're talking about handfuls, handfuls here and there. You know, you're not talking about 70,000 votes that's going to get him over the top in Arizona. That's not going to happen. And you know the places where it's tightest, Biden is ahead. Biden is ahead right now in Georgia. Biden is ahead um, in a couple of these states that Trump is contesting. So I just think the odds of Trump turning this around right now are infinitesimal. And so re I'm not saying it's totally impossible, but realistically, if you wanna know what I think, I think he's lost. And I don't think his legal challenges or the recounts are gonna to amount to much. Yeah. So, so what do you think he'll do? Do you think he just runs the table with every legal recap, every every legal course of action, and just does absolutely anything, or do you sense that maybe at some point, if what you're saying is right, 
that he will throw in the towel. I know that throwing in the towel doesn't sound like Trump. Yeah. And uh, I also think he owes it to his supporters who love him and, and don't trust these systems for good reasons to see these challenges through. I have no problem with him stoking those fires and getting in there and making sure to the extent he can, maybe it's his final act as president, right, before his lame duck period, to like disrupt yet another system, to upend it, blow it up, and ultimately make it better, right? Tear it down so we can come back better for the next four year period. Um, but I, I support his, his willingness to challenge these, you know, where he has good faith evidence of a problem, like what happened in Pennsylvania with allowing the mail-in votes to be postmarked on election day, something that was approved by judges and not legislators, which is not okay. Mm -hmm. And the US Supreme Court refused to take that challenge. They said, get back to us if this becomes an ongoing problem after the election, and if there's a split in the states that we might have to resolve. He should proceed, pursue that, he should. But I, again, it doesn't look like there are enough votes in that pile that could help him. Anyway, I think he should see it through. I don't think he should give up before he has to. But I think realistically, when it becomes clear that he's lost, we're going to need the people who are closest to him, who he trusts, not the media, which he doesn't, for good reason, to sit him down and say, it's no longer about you. Th yeah. This is about the country. And there will be a peaceful transfer of power. And while you can go out there and say, I have real problems with the way the system conducted itself, and I don't know about this vote, I am going to pass the torch and put America first, to quote somebody we all know. Do you think that part of his calculation of, of even if he sees it, that he's lost, like the challenges aren't going anywhere, that part of it will be the burn it down thing because, you know, even just a few minutes before we started here, I saw a tweet by AOC and, you know, in, in effect, you know, we're going to have to come for Trump and, his, you know, they keep saying enablers and the sycophants and whatever. And it's like, you know, a few weeks ago, Robert Reich, who was in the Clinton administration, talking about a truth and reconciliation commission and that these people love lists and all of these weird things. And it's like for all the chance of lock her up, it never happened. There was no there was nobody knocking on Hillary's door and that Trump may feel and I think actually for good reason that that these people, whether the guy did anything illegal or not, they've created this monster in their heads, let's say, and that they will do things that are unimaginable in, in yeah. the American political landscape. Well, I think, yes, they will. They, it's not paranoia when they really are out to get you. And that explains a lot of Trump's behavior. I mean, I think right. the media is like so disgusted by his rhetoric from the White House and like, it's not great. I'm not gonna defend it. But I understand where he's coming from. They have been out to get him for more than four years. The media is his enemy. They absolutely are his enemy. And the Democrats loathe him in a special way. And one does have to wonder if a lot of these Democrats think the ends justify the means. I mean, they, we, we yeah, really yeah. have had a baseless attempt to impeach the guy that was right on the heels of a completely made up Russia investigation. And not to mention all the non-controversies the media fed off of for the last four years. So he is right to totally distrust them. The pollsters have had it totally wrong when it comes to Trump all along. I do want to make a distinction between the pollsters who predict vote prior to the vote and the people at the decision desks who yeah. analyze for a living raw vote tallies. Two totally different animals, okay? So yeah. just because we don't trust the pollsters like Nate Silver doesn't mean we shouldn't trust the Fox News decision desk. But anyway, Trump has a general distrust of these systems. That's well-founded. And so, and, I, and so do his fans. And that's why I think people aren't being nuts right now. It's not like crazy conspiratorial people like no one, but it's based on data. It's based on experience. And, uh, and to expect the left to understand any of that is too much to expect. They won't. There isn't grace on the other side. I mean, there's, there's great guys like Andrew Yang, right? Who's saying all the right things, like be cool. And like, let's not go too far and whatever. And then there's just jerks like AOC, you know, or Nancy yeah. Pelosi coming out and saying we have a mandate which you don't even have close to a mandate. And, and one other point on her, the more you say you have a mandate, which you clearly do not, you lost House seats instead of gaining them. It looks like you're not gonna have control of the Senate. You didn't get the blue wave at the federal, at the presidential level. The, the more the Republicans, if they do take over that Senate, are gonna do to stymie every piece of Joe Biden's agenda. There will be no grace on their side either. 
So I actually read your tweet about Nancy Pelosi and the mandate on, on my show this morning, and I was trying to frame it in a way that, that will give people, obviously a lot of my audience you know, likes Trump. So I was trying to say, okay, if this doesn't work, if this doesn't end up the way you want it to end up, like what, what are the silver linings around this thing? And I agree with you that her tweet or her comment was so over the top that maybe it gets the Republicans to dig. And then I'm starting to think, you know, I'm not a statist generally in like a traditional sense, but I'm starting to think that maybe instead of the small government that I really want, maybe we never really get to that, but maybe the best thing we could have is sort of like an endlessly stalemated government. Yeah. Like that, that basically just can't do anything. And then what will happen is every four years, we'll have the guy do executive actions and then the next guy will reverse them. And, that, and that'll just be the way we're governed. And I know it kind of sucks. And for those of us that do this for a living, it's like, not really what you want, but like maybe in a bizarre sense, that's the last fail safe that we have. Does that yeah. make any sense? Stasis, stasis could be could be okay, right? I think that the Democrats would much have preferred stasis to Trump doing anything meaningful, and I think that's how the Republicans are feeling now. I mean, I, I my own sense of it is most Republicans aren't that scared of Joe Biden, the man, because he has a fifty of year history of legislating from the middle. But Joe Biden is elderly and not totally with it mentally, from what we've seen. And I think a lot of people are worried that he is just going to be the puppet and people like AOC and Nancy Pelosi are going to be the puppeteers. And I realize those two women don't have the same agenda, but as far as Republicans are concerned, neither is good. Right. Um, you know, you're not going to have some moderate, um, you know, Joe Manchin pulling the strings on, on Joe Biden. It's going to be right. people like that, the squad. And nobody wants a squad getting in there and telling him what to do or just pressuring him so much that he does it. So I think stasis would be okay, but I think it could be worse than stasis. It could be a bloody civil war, sort of, if you will, or political yeah. civil war, forgive the reference. Because um, if, they, if they do go after Trump, if they, if, if they decide to go after him legally and put him in jail and undo everything and like, you know, completely go after Trump and his supporters, you know, the Senate does a lot. If they, Republicans control the Senate, and I, don't, I know we're looking at two runoffs in Georgia, but Georgia, Republicans have never lost a runoff in the state of Georgia, never. Now, I realize we're gonna have a huge money dump there to try to change that this time around, but and Georgia's changing, it's becoming bluer, obviously, but the odds are on the GOP side. So let's assume for now, the GOP can, can, retains control of the Senate. They, if they retain control of the Senate, the Democrats do all those things, they're gonna make it as ugly and as acrimonious and as unfortunate for the Dems as possible. They, a lot of these cabinet choices have to be, they have to be confirmed by the Senate, right? Like, mm -hmm. what if a, what if a, a justice, uh, God forbid, dies? And you, you need confirmation by the Senate. Like there, there's a lot the Senate can do to stop a president from getting anything done. And then in two years, we have another election. And the Democrats' share of the House majority, I mean, it's going down like this. As we speak, it's getting smaller mm -hmm. and smaller and smaller. And it could get down when all is said and done to just a four seat advantage by the Dems. If that happens, they're almost certainly going to lose control in two years. So politics never stops. Yeah. yeah and yeah. You know, if, you, if you are just a complete prick, Two and four years later, it's going to come back at you. Right. And then when you look at some of the interesting numbers that broke in different ways, that the that black men voted more than two times as high for a Republican as they did last time. And black women, it went up from 4% to 8%. That's not a huge percentage, but doubling is pretty good. I saw something this morning that 16%, I think, of Muslims voted for Trump. Like all things that you just wouldn't expect, that, that uh, LGBT support for Trump actually more than doubled. So like there are some interesting signs of the future. How worried are you just about general like trust in the whole damn thing? Like that the same people who said Russia are now saying our election is tamper proof, right? Like that's the big one that I'm like seeing the hypocrisy on right now. You guys ran around saying Russia interfered in our elections four years ago. Now, now you're telling us because you got what you wanted Apparently, that the trust system systems. is perfect. So yeah. that, that people won't trust the electoral system. They already don't trust the media system. That that basically, all, you know, all of our the colleges, just the institutional level, there is just no trust in anything anymore. And I, I can't really fake it for people. You know, like I, I wish these things were better, but I don't think they are. Well, I, some of that concerns me, but most of it doesn't. Um, I think, for example, I think Joe Biden's not going to pack the Supreme Court, and that's good, because that would have been a massive move that would have ruined the Supreme Court, and that would have been the end of the Supreme Court. 
And that would, would have been a catastrophic breakdown of systems. But what if it ain't, what if it ain't Joe? Because I'm with you on that. I think Joe actually No, there's is... not support for it within the Democratic Party or writ large. There isn't. There's... So you think, you think by him getting in, it's, it's fed them enough that they won't have to do like the, the crazy stuff? I even stuff. think if, you know, if Kamala Harris were at the top of the ticket right now and, and ascending to the White House, it wouldn't happen. There isn't support for it in the United States. The, the, the people don't want it. You know, the FDR couldn't get it through when he controlled his party. Democrats controlled the House and the Senate. And he was hugely popular. Well, his support right now is 20% lower for packing the court than it was back then. It's not going to happen. People don't want it. These politicians aren't politically suicidal. So that was a good talking point by Jeffrey Tubin, who really should have been more focused on how to work his Zoom than writing provocative art articles in The New Yorker about shit that's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't think Joe Biden's going to do that. I think the reason he wouldn't answer that when he was running is because the answer was no. It was to protect his left flank, uh, you know, him from his left flank, not to protect himself from the right. But I also kind of think that distrust in, in some agencies can be good. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not all destructive. You know, it, like I think the media needed to be destroyed. And and now it will rebuild in some way, shape, or form. I mean, I really think, I've said this to you before, that the, the journalists, they've been on a kamikaze mission ever since Trump. I mean, it didn't start with Trump, but like he, he's the, it was the, that was the real mission. They've been on a kamikaze mission to take him down. And it wound up being a thing where they did kill themselves. And in the end, they, they, it does appear they took him with them. It does appear they brought him down because if you don't think the media played a role in people's perceptions of Trump these past four years, as controversial as he is legitimately banned, ban, I don't mean to give him a full pass on all the crazy mm -hmm. stuff he's done, but the media did so much of it. So they, they, are, they are a force, I don't wanna say for evil, that's too strong, but they're not to be trusted and they're not what they used to be and they're not honest about it. So they needed to be destroyed and we'll see what comes up. So maybe that's true in the FBI. They needed to be unmasked as this political organization. I had complete trust in James Comey, David. I did. I was like, Jim Comey, I, you know, the guy, uh, wrong. Yeah. And yeah. I'm grateful for having that, you know, that, that mask pulled off. And so but, but, I, can't but totally problem... di di I can't totally dismiss the dismantling of, of, of trust in some of these organizations. Right, like that. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm down with the distrust stuff. I don't I don't think they they deserve our trust anymore. But the problem is that it it sort of only got halfway. In other words, if Trump loses, well, then they've been on mass, but they're about to rebuild. You can already feel it a little bit. Like, oh, they no. didn't fully get us. So mm -hmm. here we go again. Something no, like that. No, no, no. I don't think that's right because they never lost trust with the Democrats. They they've had it. I mean, we're just going to a more fractured media world like the country used to have when we were founded and for a hundred years thereafter where you know, the left has its sources and the right has its sources. But one great thing Trump did was make very clear that virtually everybody is on that first side. Yeah. Like virtually <laughs> right. everybody is actually fighting for Democrats. There's not a Republican in the country left, I think, that thinks CNN is fair and objective news. I mean, maybe some people who really don't pay attention to the news might, might still think that. Yeah. But Republicans haven't been fooled. You know, they, they, the mask has been pulled off. So that's a good thing. You know, and I don't think they're going to, I think they're going to be very defensive of Joe Biden. I think quietly the Washington Post democracy dies in darkness. It's going to just get pulled off the mist. <laughs> it's no longer dark. So we don't need yeah, to do yeah. that. <laughs> but I think all that's great. And it gives the audience, you know, it's like, let me, let me put, you, put it to you this way. If you have a friend who's a real jerk and you didn't, you didn't know it, um, I'm thinking of my one friend's example, so I'll, get, I'll give you this. Friends of ours, interracial couple, the husband's black, the, the wife is white. And after the George Floyd thing, they were very upset because one of their white friends called them up and said, how are you doing? I hope you're okay. And then they saw, they found out, oh no, you know what? I can't tell the whole story because it will reveal who it was. Uh oh, uh oh. But it was somebody who they thought was a friend and who they had helped out with their, with respect to their kid getting into college. They had done a lot to help him. And basically the guy got outed as repeatedly okay. saying the N word and really racist stuff about black people. So they were shocked. They were horrified. And I said to them, you know what? This is a good thing. Because that was the reality yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you just mm -hmm. didn't know. Well, it's better today to know 
and and then act accordingly. It's not, it's hurtful to find out, but it's not better to be in the dark. And that's how I feel about the media and uh, these organizations, which really are politically driven, but we didn't know it. it. May hurt to learn it or not, but it's better to know and then act accordingly. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. Well, what do you think about the, the big tech element then also that, you know, going forward that at least even though they did nothing. I mean, I kept saying this the whole time, you guys are having these hearings and it's great to see Ted Cruz, who I totally like and respect. It's great to see him grill Jack, but you guys are doing it six days before an election and we're pretending that this is in theater. Are, are you worried that, okay, Trump was sort of the last thing that was stopping big tech from doing whatever it might want to do. I, I don't know what exactly what it wants to do, but now without that threat of, we're going to regulate you, whatever it might, you know, break you up, stuff that I don't particularly want them to do, uh, are, are you worried that they're just going to go all in and, and silence the real resistance, which will be, you know, the remaining free thinkers? Yes, I am worried about that. I, I don't have the solution to that either. I, I am worried. I think one of the sad things, but the realities over the past 20, 25 years is the Republicans have shown themselves to be very good at winning elections. Maybe not in this particular case for the White House, but in general, they win elections and very bad at fighting the culture wars. And it's unfortunate because now the Democrats control the media, Hollywood, um, academia, big tech, and half the country doesn't feel represented at all in almost all of the information that comes back to them publicly. Like you, sports, forgot to mention them. So you turn on the television and watch a sports game or get the news or watch the Oscars or the VMAs, whatever it is. and now you're getting wokeism shoved down your neck and you're being told you're a racist if you happen to be a Republican, you like Trump, or even just if you're a Republican these days. And you know, you send out a tweet that is totally legitimate and maybe just opinionated or a news story being reported by that New York Post, censored, censored, censored. You know, your viewpoints are be you're being told they're bad by everyone that has control of the public microphones. And I do think it leads people to be like, am I insane? Am, is everything I think yeah, awful? Yeah. I, it's a problem. And I think big tech is part of the problem. I really wish we, we'd see somebody like Peter Thiel, you know, who you know, he's going to have to actively create a new Twitter and a new Facebook. And it, like, there needs to be a real other digital forum out there that represents the other half of the country. Because I just don't think they've got much of a future on the existing platforms. Well, the irony is if, if Trump loses and then it finally gives him the impetus to be like, okay, I'm going to another platform or I'm starting my own platform, that's how the platform will, will work, right? Like that ultimately would be so. it. No, don't you don't, think, you don't think that would be enough? No, I think that'll be like, I mean, with all due respect, Sean Hannity starting his own network. Like, you know, you know what you're going to get. You're not going to get real analysis. That now, that's no, no, no. I don't mean I don't mean you'll get analysis. I mean if Trump is just like, all right, I'm going, I'm going to parlor or I'm going to locals or wherever. That it would be like everyone would go there just to, because he's still the show yes. in a way. Oh, no question. He's yeah, I don't draw, mean that he's going to create like, some nonpartisan network or something. You like can that. I, I'm not like conservative media is well represented in the digital world. I get that, but when it comes to these main the main platforms out there, when it, I mean Facebook is it gives a little bit more play, but they're they're censoring a lot of stuff too. But if you could have a real, and I know there's Parler, I'm on Parler, but it's just, it's not what Twitter is. And yeah. it, it, I don't know that it's going to be. You need a real player with a lot of money to, to create the platform and back it. And somebody with a spine of steel like Rupert Murdoch to say, I don't need to be loved at the cocktail parties. I'm going to let this be a real forum for mainstream conservative thought. In other words, we don't need Alex Jones on there, okay? Right. But like Dave Rubin does not need to get censored, right? And I, 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 that's my only thought because I, you're not going to change Jack Dorsey. You're not going to change Facebook. You're, you're not going to change these big tech organizations for whom it's like deeply ideological. <laughs> they, they think it's the difference between good and evil. You know, it's not just about getting Biden elected. It's about silencing the rest of these racists. Did you see that clip from Sonny Hostin on The View? Yeah, unbelievable. That, that embodies how they think, the, the left wing. And I don't even mean progressives. I know you used to be one. Yeah. Most progressives I know are totally normal and mainstream and they don't believe in any of this nonsense. It's the quote left with a capital L who are insane in the way they see the other half of the country. And Sonny Hostin just put it on display where it was like, these at least half the country 
I'm not going to say they're racists. Yeah. But they're racist. <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to say they're racist. But at least half the country voted for him, notwithstanding his racism, his sexism, his xenophobia, his transphobia. And then uh, another woman on the panel, Sarah, I don't remember her name, but she was like, how can you say that? You know, people vote in their own self-interest all the time, pocketbook issues and so on. Doesn't make them bad, doesn't make them racist. And the response was, no, because this is about we the people and we are supposed to behave as a collective and do what is right. One of those things, Dave, I was like, oh my God, I wish so badly for the first time in my life that I were sitting on the view. <laughs> I would have loved to said to her, I, I get it totally. And just out of curiosity, I'm wondering, because like, there's a lot of people who really feel like, for example, um, abortion is murder and it's mm -hmm. actually killing babies and that's wrong. And what would be right would be to ban it outright. And if you don't support that, you are on the wrong side. You're in favor of murder. And, and we, the people, respond yeah. you to behave as a collective, right? Like, I could go on for, you know, give me five other examples. Like, the outrage, and by the way, let's look at the southern border. You know, the people down there who have had family members killed by people illegally coming across with drugs and, and weapons, yeah. uh, who have lost jobs to people who are here unlawfully in the country, they have real reasons for wanting a, a great border wall and for cracking down on illegal immigration. And if you don't support it, you're the one who doesn't care about life and the well-being of your fellow citizens and we the people. Who died and made her king of we the people, right? But, it's like, do you think, that's do you how think they think, the left. But do you think they'll ever stop that thing? Like that, in many ways, what you just described there, that is the thing that most, the rest of us are fighting. We don't have to make it about Sonny, but that thing. And it's been so successful, and, and as we're talking, potentially is about to dethrone Donald Trump. Why would they stop doing it? They're not going to. They're not going to. I mean, I, I agreed with the headlines this week that said wokeism was dealt a blow during this election because you saw you know, his numbers, yeah. as you pointed out, with all these minority groups go up. People, the minority groups like him more than they used to, not less. Yeah, it, yeah. Like four years of ubiquitous media coverage telling them he's awful, racist, bigot, all the stuff, and that they're awful if they like him. So that didn't work. Oh, and by the way, I mean, even just today, there was a congressman, a Democratic congresswoman who was saying, uh, defund the police killed us, killed us. That is why we went down in the house instead of up. And if we don't abandon that ridiculous messaging, we're gonna get, see a bloodbath in two years. So wokeism, you know, the, the messaging was proven to be a failure when it comes to electoral politics, but that yeah. won't deter them. That's not gonna stop anything. But for the reasons I was saying, it's ideological. It's, it makes yeah. them feel like better people, superior. Um, I don't know if it's their guilt, if it's just the virtue signaling makes them feel great about themselves in bed at night when they judge other people and, and decide they're all bad. So we're going to have to deal with it. And the people who don't believe in this BS culture, and there's so many people in the center right who don't either. Look at the Harper's letter, letter, letter look at people like Andrew Sullivan who hated Trump, but you know, he's completely taken a stand against this baloney. They're going to have to speak up. They're, the, the people who are against it, I know they're afraid. I know you can get fired now for the most ridiculous reasons. Trust me, I know. Um, <laughs> we're going to have to start taking risks. Otherwise, we're all going to go down. You know, we're going to go down together on this war. Yeah. On, on a personal note, as you were watching the election and, and you're not in the big studio and doing all that stuff that you've done in the past, did, did, you, did you enjoy it more in a weird way? Because you could just kind of watch it and be on your couch or... Were you on your couch? Where were you? I was. Yeah, I was doing a bunch of hits from here, my living yeah. room. So I will say that. Oh, right. You were, you were on Daily Wire right before me that night. You were, yeah. you were home. Yeah, yeah I, I saw you. you. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, no, can I tell you honestly, that's the first time that I've actually missed being on TV since I went off TV. Huh. I love those big election nights, and I, I think I know how to anchor them well. You know, and I, it's one of those things where if you're a strong pitcher and you see somebody else pitching in the big game, you're like, hmm, I wish I could be doing it. So that was like one of the first nights I think that I actually thought, oh, I'd love to be out there. But that's not to not to disparage anybody who was out there, just that I sort of missed throwing my fastball. Yeah. So so what's next then for the me uh, Megyn Kelly media empire? If you missed that, no, no, I no, sense no. I sense something. You just said you not missed something. Not at all. No, no, no. I I love what I'm doing. I'm I am loving my podcast. It's like I'm home. I yeah. I chose right. This is exactly right for me. It's a new forum. It's one in which I can use 
all aspects of my personality. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm loving it, but that doesn't mean it can scratch every itch, but I, I have no desire to go back to Fox or, you know, cable news at all. I, you know, as you know, I left it for very good reasons. You know, who yeah, happen yeah. to be 11, nine and seven right now. And they're more important to me than taking care of that. Yeah. I don't think that I asked you this when I had you on a couple of weeks ago, but what is your sort of philosophical or religious, like, what is your, like the thing that's beneath politics that kind of keeps you sane throughout this? Cause when we're talking about the people that use this in a religious nature and how wokeism has, has caused so much destruction and caused people to become believers who otherwise usually aren't believers in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. I find the only people that are making sense to me these days are people that come at it from some sort of belief aspect. I'm not, they can have very various versions of it, but like, what is like beneath just your political outlook of life? Well, it's, it's more like it's above my political outlook of life. And yeah. I, just, I, I just feel like politics is over here and I'm yeah. here. I don't, this is like something we talk about. It's, it's, not, it, it's not who I am. It's not, it's not really that important to me. I have to get involved because it brings up important fights that one must fight. And, and I cover it, you know, as a, as a journalist and a commentator. But when I, I am a woman of faith, I'm not particularly observant in my Catholicism, but I was raised Catholic and I have that moral imprint on me. Um, and I believe in God and I totally believe in an afterlife and a higher power. And I, I guess I just believe what we're here for is our human connections and not any of this BS. This is, this is small stuff that people use to, who enjoy divisiveness. They enjoy hostility. And I really believe a lot of them have too little fulfillment in their own lives. And they, you know, the smaller your life gets, the more you feel the need to, to fill it with something else, be it drama, be it anger, fighting. I'm not in that boat. I, I am filling the main picture over here. Mm -hmm. P-I-T-C-H-E-R. Mm -hmm. My children, my husband, my marriage, my friendships, myself, my, my, you know, my enjoyment in life. And then politics over here and I'll take a swim over and I'll fight where I need to fight. But I just think people who have nothing to like remind them, it's just a limited time we're here together, um, make, make bad choices. And I'll, I'll put one period on it. I interviewed Adam Carolla recently, who I just adore. Yeah, me too. And he said it such a, in such a good way. He said, I have no time for people who obsess over people who are generally good but sometimes say controversial things or do not. <laughs> and, and he, cause I was asking him, how is he, how's he best friends with Jimmy Kimmel, right? Who like doesn't seem to really like conservatives and Adam pretty much is like, what, how does that work? And he just sees everybody in terms of like, look, that's not a bad person there. Who's like doing good things. And even like AOC, right? She's not a bad person. She's young. She's a whippersnapper. She got herself elected to Congress from being a bartender. I mean, on some level, you got to respect that. You don't have to agree with the word she says politically, and you don't have to like her judgments of other people. But like, should we be focused on tearing down, uh, let's see, the, the civilian AOCs of the world? No. Like, why don't we get so upset about them? They might be a minor, minor irritant. You know, like Sonny Hostin, I was just ripping on her because she's got hostility for everybody. Do we really need to worry about the Sonny Hostins? No. We should fight the political battles. Just don't get so upset personally over these people. I'm like, you know, when, it, when it's coming into your life and it's, it has a po the, the power to like fire you or make you lose your job or make endanger your children, you got to perk up and you got to pay attention. But you don't have to get personally offended by everything somebody else stands for. You know, you did it to me last time and you did it this time, which is, you know, how to end an interview because we could keep going here and talk more about politics or the election. But I think that, that was it. That was it. I'm not going to drag out anything else. <laughs> that, that was just perfect. So we are going to link uh, to the podcast down below. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, thanks for taking subscribe. the time. Subscribe. You got to subscribe. Oh, subscribe. It's very, very important to subscribe and, <laughs> uh, and enjoy the weekend, Megan. And, you know, don't think about politics the whole time. Have fun with the kids and the dog. That's the plan. Uh, and the husband and the husband. And <laughs> hopefully we'll, we'll do this in real life soon. See you soon, Dave. Lots of love. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about the media instead of nonstop yelling, check out our media playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out the full episode playlist. They're both right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.